really struggled with how to present this material in a way that will be helpful to you and also help us get uh, the, the insights from the scripture. As you know, what your lesson has done both this week and also will be doing next week is to pick out various themes from a big chunk of the scriptures. And as I was working the lesson and then as I was praying about it, I realized I can't... <laughs> I can't do a talk like that, uh, including all of that. And so what I've decided to do, and I hope it doesn't mess up your lesson preparation for next week, but I want to cover today a section that really goes together. It's, verse, it's chapters 24 to 27. I'm going to do that today, and you can tell that from uh, the outline that I wrote on the board. And then next week I'll cover 32 to 35, which you had a look at this week, but most of the lesson next week is based on chapters 32 to 35. And then our lesson book will take us back, uh, that the two weeks from today, will take us back into chapters 28 to 31, because that's a little bit of a section as well. So what I want to do this morning is, is work on uh, talking about and thinking about chapters 24 to 27. So if you'll be kind of tooling your brains along that way. Uh, we have skipped chapters 30, 13 to 23, uh, with good reason, as you, if you probably tried to look at that, there's a lot of judgment, there are different nations mentioned, all of the nations were existing at the time that uh, Isaiah was be giving these prophecies, uh, and we have, we have skipped all of that, but when we start in chapter 24, it's almost as if now the, the culmination of all of that in Isaiah's mind is taking place with really a more of a worldwide judgment being, being given uh, by God with regard to the sin of not only just his own people, but the nations. And I thought it would be good to, you, you, I don't know if you think the same way I do, but Sometimes I have a hard time, uh, I, I, can, I can understand that God uh, can expect things from his covenant people because he made that covenant. And we look back at Exodus 20 even today in the lesson. Uh, and the covenant that he made with, especially with the Israelite people, the descendants of Abraham, is very well laid out, is it not? It's almost as if how could they not have uh, remembered all of these things that the Lord had said. So in a way we can, we can understand why God would, would be judging his own people because they have failed to keep the covenant. But we think about, at least I do, I think about, well, what about these other nations? They weren't the chosen people. They didn't have Exodus 20. They didn't have uh, the, the worship. They didn't have the, the word of God specifically given to their nation. So I, I thought it would be good for us to think about that just for a moment before we actually move into the scripture. You know, sometimes God does judge a nation because of what they've done to his people. Back in chapter 10. Remember there was God's judgment on the king of Assyria. God had let Assyria be the tool of judgment for the uh, on Israel because of their sin. But he went way, the king went way overboard with regard to that and got so enraptured with his power that he thought he had done it himself. And so God deliberately says in chapter 10 that uh, you are going to be judged for what you have done to my people. So it, we find that also in, in the uh, predictions of the Babylonian Empire that captured the nation of Judah about 150 years after Isaiah's time. So sometimes God does, does judge heathen nations uh, because of what they've done to his people. But there's a, a more specific and overriding understanding that we have of the nation's responsibility to God. God owns the universe because he created it. And the owner of the universe is the one who gets to write the rules. Now, we may not like his rules, but the owner is the one who gets, the, and the one who made it, gets to write the rules. Uh, and, and so in 20, chapter 24, verse 5, we have um, the, the term, they have broken the everlasting covenant. 
Uh, and I think you looked a little bit with regard to that, but I'd like to have you uh, turn back to Genesis chapter 9 because it's helpful for us, I think, to see what it is that God is referring to through Isaiah in this passage. In Genesis chapter 9, uh, you may remember that starting in chapter 6, this is the universal flood. This is the judgment on all people. People were so wicked that God decreed that he was going to destroy the entire uh, earth uh, as far as the civilized civilization and all and all of the um, vegetation as well as every human being uh, and animal except for the the animals that came to the ark with Noah and the eight people that God enclosed in the ark and after then when the water goes down and and the flood is over uh, in Genesis chapter 9 verse 8 <clears throat> then God said to Noah and his sons, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And uh, then goes on to uh, promise the rainbow that he places in the sky to remind it's kind of the seal of the covenant this is most likely the covenant that Isaiah refers to when we're back in chapter uh, 24 however Paul in his writing to the letter to the Romans also speaks about the responsibility that the heathen nations those who don't know who haven't been given the revelation that had been given to Israel what their responsibility is and if you want to flip back to Romans chapter 2 you will see uh, what God says through Paul about responsibility of the creation and especially the, the nations. What has God done in order to give them the, uh, the ability to uh, kick into the covenant that he has made? In Romans chapter 2, verse 14, uh, Romans 2, 14, Indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required of the law, they are a law for themselves even though they don't have the law. In other words, Paul is saying uh, within people there is the desire to do what God wants. Verse 15, since they show that the requirements of the law are written in their hearts, we speak of that as conscience, we speak of that as, as the awareness of, of God, and their thoughts are now accusing them and even defending them. And so Paul, in, the New, in a New Testament context, also uh, re is going to be making a, a huge case uh, up through Romans 3 that everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God, including uh, Israel, but also including these Gentiles who were not specifically given uh, the Ten Commandments in, in Exodus chapter 20. So. Uh, as we think about God's right to judge the nations, we can understand that, it's, uh, that we, there is credible reason for God to not, this is not, um, the promise of judgment is not, you know, a celestial being going on a rant because there are things that he doesn't like about his creation. No, here is the Holy One of Israel, the one that Isaiah saw in chapter 6, uh, who is uh, attended by angels, who is being praised constantly for his holiness. He is the one who uh, has even uh, warned his people through the prophets. He has uh, he even sent Jonah to Nineveh. Remember that, that uh, episode, uh, probably earlier than Isaiah's time? Uh, he, sent, he warns people about judgment. Uh, and indeed, he held off the judgment on Israel and on Judah for hundreds of years while the prophets were sent to give them a uh, warning about that. And so here now, I think we can see that although it's not fun for us to think about the judgment, uh, I think we can certainly understand that God is not overstepping his bounds uh, by doing that. Uh, now Isaiah does seem to be kind of covering the same ground again and again. The themes, as I mentioned earlier, will be kind of surfacing again and again. Now in your study book, don't turn to it now, but uh, on page 111, which is a couple of lessons ahead of where we are now, there's a little explanatory paragraph about the prophetic oracles and about how Isaiah would have received these oracles at different times. And so what seems to us to be kind of 
scattered, uh, actually was the, the fruit of thought that Isaiah was given by revelation from God at various times. And one of the things it mentions in that little paragraph is that sometimes one of the oracles, the sayings that God has given him, may be only a couple of verses. Uh, but then there may be huge chapters that we're working with. And so uh, as we realize that, uh, don't get upset because we've already talked about judgment, because that's going to happen again, uh, because of another way that God was approaching his people with the truth of his, his purposefulness uh, for them. Uh, chapters 24 to 27 sometimes are called Isaiah's Apocalypse. Apocalypse, we mostly think of in, in the four horsemen of the apocalypse, we think about revelation, don't we? We think about all that apocalyptic, uh, visionary, of, of catastrophic stuff that is described in, uh, in revelation. And there's a lot of language in chapters 24 to 27 that remind us uh, of what we see in, in the revelation apocalypse. Uh, what is be, what's happening here in chapters 24 to 27? 27, if I were to make a summary of it, is that the Lord brings judgment on all the nations of the world for breaking his covenant with them. And then after this, there will be a world embracing salvation with a remnant praising and glorifying God. So basically, that's the program. God is going to uh, put judgment on all the nations of the world because of their breaking the covenant with him. And then there also will be, following that, the, the just the eruption of splendor and glory and peace, uh, salvation with a remnant that is praising and glorifying God. Do we know when this takes place? Um, no. It's, has it happened already? Uh, some of the things that we can look back in the scripture and also in history indicate that um, in the micro there may have been and there probably has been the judgment of God upon the nations. We can look only as far as what happens to Judah uh, about 150 years after Isaiah's time when the Babylonians come and they just wipe out uh, all, all of the profitable life in that, in that nation. Uh, we can, so we can look at the micro and see that God has done that. Uh, does he still judge nations? Um, possibly. Uh, we can look at some of, even within uh, the last century, we can look at some of the things that have happened to godless empires, and we can see that there has been, uh, whether it's using natural circumstances, whether it's using uh, opposition within a nation, there has been judgment uh, in the micro uh, on sinful, wicked, uh, tyrant nations, uh, but there's still a whole bunch of tyrant nations that haven't been judged, I think, uh, so often of uh, the, the wonderful country of Zimbabwe that has just been ruined by uh, the dictator that has just kind of sucked the life out of, of all of that. Uh, so perhaps in, in a small way God has, has done this already, but when we're looking at chapter 24, it's as if we're now seeing the macro. We're seeing something that uh, from our point of view has not happened in a universal way as yet. So let's think about that uh, as, we, as we look at these chapters, remembering that although we're thinking about the catastrophes, we're thinking about the judgment, the real main player in this account is God. It's the, he is the Lord, and he is the one who is in, in action here. And so chapter 24 really talks about both the heavens and the earth being being judged, excuse me. Um, there's, there's just wonderful rejoicing in chapter 25 because of the great liberation that has happened. Uh, and the praise of God's redeemed people starts in 26 and, and goes through the first verse of 27. And then the people that God is going to bring back together again are described in the latter part of ch chapter 27. So if you're interested in an outline, I've kind of struggled. I borrowed some things from the commentaries I was reading because these are not the easiest things to, uh, to make an outline of. But I hope this will help you to hang some thought processes on this as you continue now in our next in our next week's lesson. First of all, then let's look at chapter 24, starting in verse 1, where both 
earth and the heavens are judged. Uh, verse 1c, uh, or perhaps uh, some of your versions have behold, it's, it's kind of a more striking way to say, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for the priest is for the people, for the master is for the servant, for mistress is for the maid, etc., etc. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. It's almost as if he's putting his, his seal on this. Very powerful picture painting uh, with regard to this judgment. And you can see that e no level of society is, is exempt from this. It's going to be uh, touching all of society. Laid, waste, devastated, uh, those words really strike fear into us. They give us a picture uh, of what uh, things are like. You may have seen some of the, the newsreels that, that came out after World War II and, and the way that Germany had been bombed and you saw the, the, just the devastation, these burned out buildings. We even see it today when we're looking at pictures on TV about Syria and the devastation that has happened. Well, this was going to be even worse because it's going to be, uh, be, be worldwide. <clears throat> this can't just be the end of the earth. Uh, as the scientists say, the cosmos is finally going to just um, disintegrate or whatever. This is God intervening in judgment and giving what is due to wickedness, uh, what, has, what has, ha he has intervened in history. <clears throat> Verse 4 also does the same thing, the earth dries up and withered. Reason for this, and now God never does things without a reason. He doesn't have to tell us about the reason, but he does tell us the reason here, and it's, it's, it's an understandable reason. Verse 5, first of all, <clears throat> The earth is defiled by its people. Back in Genesis, when Adam and Eve were given care of the earth, they were supposed to tend and feed and care for the earth. That's mankind's job uh, on the earth. And so what has happened, why God is, is, is full of wrath against the people of the earth, is because they have defiled the earth, they have violated um, or altered God's statutes to make them li like they would like to have it. <coughs> Excuse me. And then they have broken the everlasting covenant. Uh, these, this then is in capsule form. <coughs> Excuse me. What? God is judging uh, the earth and the heavens for. As we look then, we see in verse uh, 7, the, the way society looks now. What's happened? <clears throat> New wine dries up, the vine withers, and the merrymakers groan. I have, Darcy, I have some. I have a liquid. I have a liquid. I'm just trying not to use it. Thank you. Marco Rubio, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That off, take that off of the tape. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, wine in, in scripture is a symbol of joy. Uh, no matter how abstemious we may feel as Baptists, wine in, in culture is, is joy. And so what happens? The wine dries up. There's nothing left. It's just everything kind of just, just dries up. And the noise of the revelers has stopped. The joyful harp is silent. Um, the ruined city lies desolate. The entrance to every house is barred. There, there's, there's, um, uh, they're afraid to come out because of uh, what, what is happening out there in the streets. They cry out for wine. All joy turns to gloom. All gaiety is banished from the earth. So, verse 13, it will be on the earth and among all the nations when an olive tree is beaten or as when gleanings are left after the grape harvest. There will be nothing left. This is now the picture of the devastation that happens uh, when God actually begins to judge, uh, judge the earth. In verse 14, verses 14 through the first part of 16, it's all, all of a sudden, there's no reason that we can see, but all of a sudden there's praise. There's celebration of God. They raise their voices, they shout for joy. From the west they acclaim the Lord's majesty. Why would, they, why would there be praise happening at a time like this? at a time of the devastation of the earth. Uh, from the ends of the earth, verse 16, we hear singing glory to the righteous one. A righteous one must judge sin and evil. 
And so God, as he is being God, as he is doing God things, which includes judging evil, what can we do but praise him? We don't praise him for loved ones lost or for, you know, fortunes disintegrated or whatever, but we can praise God that he's being God and that he has, is demonstrating that he is in control. And apparently in Isaiah's vision, in this oracle that he's given, right at this point, even in the midst of, because we're going to get in verse, um, back in verse 16, uh, we're still going to come back to the judgment. Even in the midst of this, we understand that this is about God and about his glory. This is about God. the end of, chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Uh, the chief end of the creation is to glorify God. And so when this is happening, God is moving forward in being God and in doing what, what he needed to do to accomplish his purposes. And so we can glorify God for doing uh, the, the righteous thing. Uh, uh, verse, let's see, let's go into verse, the latter part of 16. But I said, now here's Isaiah, uh, but I said, I waste away, I waste away, woe to me, the treacherous betray, terror and pit and snare await you, O peoples of the earth. Uh, he, Isaiah is still gravitating toward this vision uh, of, of the devastation and the judgment. Verse 18, the floodgates of the heavens are open and the foundations of the earth shake. Uh, if you remember the account of the flood, you'll remember that the heaven, the floodgates of heaven were opened and the earth opened up, up and uh, to give all of this water that, that drowned the earth. This is the same kind of language. So we, we understand that this is cataclysmic. This is something that is very, very real. Verse uh, 19, the earth is broken up, the earth is split asunder, the earth is thoroughly shaken. If you didn't understand it the first time, Isaiah says it three times. The earth reels like a drunkard, it sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again. Uh, some kind of thinking that we also can see in the book of Revelation, can't we? This same kind of uh, thing happening. Then in verse 21, in that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. Uh, what, is, what are the powers in the heavens above? You know, Paul in Corinthians talks about the fact that our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but against spiritual wicked, wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan has been thrown out of heaven but he still has access to heaven. We know that from the book of Job. Uh, we know when Jesus was on earth that uh, the demons who were inhabiting individuals uh, were, were aware of Jesus and they were aware of their doom, eventual doom. And we're told in Revelation that the doom that is, uh, given, that is prepared for the devil and his angels is what is also going to be that which is the doom of the unregenerate. And so uh, this is a picture not only of judgment on the earth, the kings on the earth, but also of these powers uh, and beings, demonic beings that followed Satan that are uh, allowed a, a leash of some way, but they are, they are under God's control yet, and they will eventually have this final judgment. And that appears to be what we're saying in verse 21. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. Uh, verse 23, the moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed, for uh, they don't need to shine anymore because the brightness will be the Lord Almighty. He will reign in Mount Zion and Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. So here now uh, in chapter 24, we see a, a picture not only of judgment, but of the glory that God receives from that. Uh, going on into 25, uh, and this is where we see praise to God. You may have on your, um, in your NIV, praise to the Lord as the heading of this. Uh, and I, I'm going to go... I know you all think I talk fast already. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to go P 
piece by piece with regard to, to this. And so if you can't write it down, don't worry about it. You can watch it on, on the web if you want to. But just think about what Isaiah is saying here as I kind of move us quickly through these next chapters. I've called it the great liberation because God is now going to liberate uh, and make right the things that have been wrong uh, all, all, all through the sinful world. Verse 1, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. This insight that Isaiah has through inspiration is that this is not just a uh, plan B or C or D because things got so bad, but this was planned long ago. Great security we have, ladies, in the understanding that nothing is happening that God has not planned in his great mind long ago. One of the things that happens in this liberation is that the ruthlessness of the nations will be stamped out. You'll see the word ruthlessness, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 5, because verse 4, you have become a refuge for the, for the poor, a refuge for the needy, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. What wonderful picture of, of the um, security in the Lord for the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. Uh, and so you silence that uproar. The song of the ruthless is is stilled. And so there's the end of the kind of tyranny, the ruthlessness, the, the tyrants that have been uh, put, making havoc um, the righteous at this point. There's also an end of the shroud of darkness that has become a pall over the earth. Verse 6. Uh, <clears throat> now let's go to verse 7. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord, sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. Uh, the disgrace that believe as well as the Jewish race have endured uh, for all these years will now be wiped out. This is a <laughs> liberation from darkness, from death, from disgrace. And then also those who have been prideful will also be brought to an end, starting in verse 9 and going through verse 12. In that day they will say, and this is now the redeemed ones, surely this is our God, we trusted in him and he saved us. This is our Lord, we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in our salvation. Uh, and then we could insert the word for, starting in verse 10, for the Lord, hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. Moab will be trampled under him as straw is trampled down in manure. Verse 11, God will bring down their pride despite the cleverness of, his, of their hands. Uh, Moab standing, I think, for the, the natural enemies of, of Israel that had been over the centuries. As he just mentions the one nation. But what's going to happen is those who, are not, who chose to trust God are to be vindicated. And they now rejoice in the salvation that he provides, and the ones who were prideful and thought that they had it all made are the ones that are going to be cast down. So 25, chapter 25 talks about the joy of liberation from darkness, from death, from the oppression that has happened. And then in chapter 26, starting in 26, uh, it's especially a song of those who are the redeemed. Uh, it says in verse 1, in that, that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah. And then this is a, a wonderful uh, song in verse, uh, starting in verse 1. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. We are enclosed securely. Uh, and then a verse that maybe you didn't even know was in Isaiah. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord, is the rock eternal. Uh, this is the theme that runs all the way through Isaiah. Who are you going to trust? And these redeemed people can celebrate the fact that they have had and still do have perfect peace because of their putting their trust in, in the Lord. And the fruit of that trust, we look in verse 5. He humbles those who dwell on high. He lays the lofty city low. He lay, levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust. Feet trample it down. 
the feet of the oppressed and the footsteps of the poor. But, verse 7, the path of the righteous is level. Uh, and so they now can have a chance, uh, after God has now put down the enemy, uh, they can now rejoice in being the ones who experience the protection and the smooth way of walking in the Lord's way. Verse 8, Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and your renown is the desire of our hearts. Isn't that a verse to put on your refrigerator? Uh, uh, your name and your renown is the desire of our hearts. These are the redeemed ones now that God has really plucked out of uh, the, the devastation. They have been, a, they have, their culture and prob, prob, most likely their nation has been uh, the brunt of the judgment, but they themselves have had that peace. The, pe the, the You will keep him in perfect peace, or uh, the Hebrew I understand says, you will keep in peace, peace, uh, like it's underlined, like it's in a big font, peace, peace, shalom, well-being, not just the absence of war, but a full well-being uh, with the blessing of the Lord. Why? Because uh, he trusts in you. Uh, the path of the righteous, verse 7, is level, uh, and that's exciting, but when your judgment, uh, let me go to verse 9, my soul yearns for you in the night, in the morning my spirit longs for you. Uh, when your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. Uh, and isn't that true? Isn't it the way that people understand God and his righteousness is when he extends his hand uh, in judgment. Uh, verse 10, though grace is shown to the wicked, they don't learn righteousness. Even in a land of uprightness, they're doing evil and regard not the majesty of the Lord. But remember now, what, we're, what the redeemed are about is exalting the name of the Lord. So, in verse 13, uh, your name alone do we honor. In verse 15, you have gained glory for yourself. You have extended all the borders of the land. And so the song, the rejoicing of the redeemed people is because in this judgment, God has glorified himself. He's protected this little nucleus of people who are believers uh, in their trust in him. He has maintained his, um, the stead they have maintained their steadfast faith. Uh, and so they can praise God. God with regard to that. Verse 16 talks about the fact that this hasn't been an easy way uh, for, for them to be. As a woman with child and about to give birth rise and cries in her pain, so were we in your presence, Lord. We were with child. This was agonizing to go through this. This was agonizing. We writhed in pain when we gave birth to the wind. We have not brought salvation to the earth. We have, we have not given birth to the people of the world. They have not, but God is bringing this about. And the next verse are really very important verses to us, starting in verse 9, well, it is verse 19, uh, as far as a specific statement about the bodily resurrection of those who die. Verse 19, your dead will live their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. Each er, The earth will give birth to her dead. Uh, Job talks about it in chapter 19. I know that my Redeemer lives, and in my flesh I will see God. Uh, that's the one landmark verse in the Old Testament about the resurrection. This is the second one. And the Apostle Paul, when he talks about the resurrection of our Lord in 1 Corinthians 15 now puts that together and talks about the specifics that our Lord was the first one who was resurrected, bodily resurrected. And because of that, because of this promise here, because of the, of the resurrection of our Lord, we too can understand that we will be resurrected. And so these people who said, we didn't, we didn't get to... We didn't get to see your work finished, Lord. We didn't get to see this, this wonderful uh, worldwide reign of righteousness. We didn't get to see that. Uh, the Lord says, but, but you will. You will be raised. You will see what I have promised that will happen. And so verse 20, Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath passes by. 
kind of reminds you of Noah and the Ark, doesn't it? With the wrath and the water and all that going all around it. Kind of reminds you of in Exodus where the blood on the doorpost was put and they were in their house. They didn't dare go outside of the protection of that blood because they were hidden uh, until the time that the Lord came. And so here's a picture now of how the righteous will be. Will they be physically protected? We don't know. Will they be spiritually protected? Surely they will be because of the promises of God with regard to that. And so uh, the promise of God's bringing his purposes to fruition is very, very clear. Uh, and so in, verse, in chapter 27, we see that these godly people now are described. Verse 2 of chapter 27. In that day, sing about the fruitful vineyard. Uh, we had that vineyard back there in what was it, chapter 5, I think it was. The vineyard that God had tended and very carefully nourished and it only brought forth bad fruit. Uh, now we see that although the Lord is still faithfully tending this, uh, in <clears throat> Verse 6, we see that finally this vine, this plant that God has so carefully tended, is finally going to bud and blossom. The nation of Israel will bud and blossom and fill the world with all of its fruit. There's a lot of implication in that that we certainly don't have time to explore right now. But uh, in God's purposes for that vine, Israel will be accomplished. He's not going to be thwarted. And so... Uh, in as as it sh shows in starting in verse seven and going through eleven, uh, there will be the judgment. There will be uh, the devastation. But eventually, in God's time, starting in verse twelve of chapter twenty-seven, we see that God now is going to bring His faithful people back home. Uh, in that day, the Lord will thresh from the flowing Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt, and you, O Israelites, will be gathered up one by one. Nobody's going to get left. Nobody's going to have to run and catch the bus uh, later on because everyone will be, will be brought back. In that day, the great trumpet will sound. Those who are perishing in Assyria, those who are exiled in Egypt, will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. That was home for the Israelite people, was it not? And when they were scattered away from Jerusalem, uh, they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Uh, exile was terrible for them. Uh, but the Lord promises that in his time, uh, verses 12 and 13, he is going to bring home all of those who had been scattered. Uh, is that happening uh, physically today? We had talked about a little bit about, about that last week. We are not sure whether bringing uh, the, the Jewish people back to their nation at this point is a we know it's not a complete fulfillment. It might be the harbinger of a fulfillment, but in God's time, that will happen. And as we progress through Isaiah, we're going to see a little bit more about that. Uh, as they're brought home, as they're brought back to be able to worship the Lord in the place that he had ordained for them to worship, it kind of reminds us then, again, doesn't it, of that verse in chapter 26, your name and your renown is the desire of our heart. Does it bother you that so many people today are living in rebellion against God or are just ignoring him? Does this, does this disturb you? Uh, does injustice uh, anger you? It should. The Lord may choose to bring local judgment on our nation, uh, on other nations, as he did in biblical times. Or he may wait until the end of time in some of these cataclysmic things that we see happening. But we do know that in God's economy, perpetrators of wickedness will be brought to justice. The Lord will reign in righteousness and justice. Isaiah is clear in telling us this. Uh, and I wonder, are you presently experiencing that perfect peace that the Lord gives to those who have steadfast minds? Uh, there's, I don't think it's any... Uh, any thing that is unusual, that when the Apostle Paul talks about the armor 
of the believer. He talks about the helmet of salvation so that your mind, uh, your, your saved mind is, is protected from being flaked off with all of this. Uh, the perfect peace that God gives to his people because their mind is fixed on him. They're, they're not letting these other terrible things infringe upon what God is giving them. He truly is the eternal rock, the refuge for all who are oppressed. And I wonder, can you truly say that your name, Lord, and your renown is the desire of my heart? The more we know about God's character and his thoughts and his plans, the better we are going to be able to make that our passion, your name, and your renown is the desire of our hearts.